Navigator. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, an inflation nightmare returns to haunt Latin America. Once again, central banks throughout the continent have increased interest rates sharply to tame prices. But are the financial measures working? Also this week, struggling with a full-blown financial meltdown, Lebanon reaches a preliminary deal with the International Monetary Fund, but are politicians ready to implement economic reforms? And West Africa is facing the worst food crisis in a decade. That's why more than a quarter of Africa's population is facing hunger. So what can be done to feed the continent's vulnerable people? So inflation is dipping into people's pockets almost everywhere, but Latin Americans are among those most severely hit. Central banks throughout the continent were quick to take action, implementing aggressive interest rate increases. But the measures have done little to bring down the cost of living. If anything, consumer prices soared in many nations last month. The situation could get worse as the war in Ukraine drives the prices of commodities up. Well, the surge in fuel and food prices is sparking discontent among many Latin Americans. Thousands of Peruvians have taken to the streets to protest the rising cost of living. Inflation hit its highest level in a quarter of a century in Peru, and the central bank has raised interest rates to a 13-year high to tame the prices. The president, Pedro Castillo, who's facing calls to resign, has cut fuel taxes and increased the minimum wage in an attempt to calm the protesters. But prices are not only going up in Peru, inflation has surpassed expectations right across different Latin American countries in March. Take a look at Chile's consumer prices, which posted the biggest monthly gain in almost three decades as bread surged by around 6% and energy rose by just under 3%. Brazil's monthly inflation soared the most since 2003 as gasoline skyrocketed by almost 7%. The annual figure hit a 20-year high in Mexico, driven mainly by cooking gas and gasoline prices. And Argentina's consumer prices have risen by more than 6%, the highest level in two decades. Inflation is expected to hit 60% by the end of the year. That's while the region's economy is expected to grow by less than 2.4% this year, down from a 6.8% expansion in 2021. But the continent is a major global producer of commodities at a time the world faces supply crunches. Chile is the world's leading producer of copper, whose price hit an all-time high in March, while Brazil and Colombia are among the region's biggest exporters of crude oil. Well, to discuss the inflation challenge in Latin America, I'm joined now by Carlos de Souza. Carlos is the Director of Emerging Markets Debt Portfolio Manager at Vondabel Asset Management. He's joining us from Zurich. Welcome to the program, uh, Carlos de Souza. So, as we've been reporting, inflation forecasts in Latin America are worse than expected. In many countries, they're reaching levels uh, that they haven't uh, reached in decades. In countries like Brazil, for example, tell us why that is. And are there specific reasons, uh, inflation-specific reasons to Latin America? Hi, thank you for having me. Um, yes, inflation in several countries is quite high, uh, multi-year high. This is a global phenomenon, quite frankly. So there are not that many particular reasons why um, inflation is high in Latin America. Inflation, in fact, in Latin America is at very similar levels than in the rest of the world. Brazil is perhaps one exception. Uh, where you have inflation at the moment at 11.3%, uh, which is higher than in the United States and in the rest of Latin America as well. For Brazil in particular, I would say that um, the fiscal stimulus that Brazil um, imposed in 2020 during the pandemic was larger than in the majority of the Latin American countries and in the majority of emerging markets. It was more comparable to the fiscal stimulus of the United States. And I also have to say that the COVID-related restrictions in Brazil were much less stringent than in the rest of the world. So Brazil actually started recovering faster. Uh, and that's why um, inflation also came earlier in Brazil. And the last reason is the weakness of the Brazilian real uh, during the last two years. However, what I have to say is that Brazil also was the first country to start hiking rates very aggressively. And it's the only country where real interest rates, so interest rates minus inflation, are actually positive. So Brazil already took interest rates to 11.75%, and the Brazilian real has been recovering quite strongly uh, this year. So, yeah, so what it, you're it, saying is the, the, the measure that some governments have taken, including Brazil, 
uh, other countries in mm -hmm. the continent took that measure to implement interest rate hikes. That measure has been working to tackle inflation? Hiking rates takes time to uh, to tackle inflation because what central banks can influence via interest rates is aggregate demand. That usually takes some six months to take an effect. So I would not say that it's not working. I would just say that central banks have to be patient. Uh, they have to hike rates, and then maybe six months later, you will see inflation slowing down. Moreover, central banks control or influence aggregate demand. They don't influence supply. And we are now in the world seeing a lot of supply shocks. We've seen much higher commodity prices. Uh, we're seeing the global trade has a lot of disruptions. There's nothing central banks can do about that. And, and that's not particular of Latin America. That, that's a global phenomenon. Right. And that is, of course, down to the Ukraine war. But do you expect more price increases, especially as that war in Ukraine is driving uh, commodity prices up? Prices will continue to increase because inflation is quite high and inflation is not going to drop to zero tomorrow. Therefore, prices will have to continue increasing. But that's different than inflation accelerating much more than today. So if you frame the question as, do I expect inflation to accelerate much more? Perhaps only a little bit, not very much more. Do I expect prices to continue increasing? Yes, absolutely. OK, got it. Um, let's look at, for example, uh, President Castillo, who announced tax cuts and increased minimum wage. Do you think that has helped the situation in this country? And what other measures should governments ta ta take on uh, to tackle this problem, in your opinion? I don't think that's going to make a big difference, uh, to be honest. Uh, what the governments can do today is, number one, let the central banks do their job, which so far they're doing. So be patient on that sense. And what they should do perhaps a bit more is to increase transfers of direct cash transfers to the poor so that they are not as affected. Uh, for example, a week ago, there were these protests in Peru and the protesters were uh, saying that inflation was high. Uh, so that was the main, one of the main reasons of, of, of the protest. But inflation in Peru is actually the lowest in Latin America. It's about 6.2% which is low, much lower than in the United States and much lower than the Eurozone and, and that in most countries, quite frankly. Uh, so it's not so much that people were protesting because inflation is high, but because the very poor now cannot afford their usual standard of living. Uh, and that can be tackled by governments by transferring money specifically to the very poor people that are the most affected. OK, and just put it sort of all into context for us. And look, inflation, obviously, the fact is that it is increasing in countries in Latin America. Economic growth expected to slow down or it has been slowing down up until this point. What does this mean for, for Latin American economies going forward? So again, that, that's also a global phenomenon. We see growth slowing down at a global level, the same as we see inflation uh, accelerating at a global level. So I would not say this is particular of Latin America. Um, in fact, because commodity prices are so high and many Latin American countries are commodity exporters, uh, they are actually better positioned to recover from, from the current circumstances. And, and high commodity prices is likely to increase medium-term growth in a lot of the Latin American economies. So I would conclude by saying that in the medium term, this could be relatively positive for growth. And more importantly, that because central banks in Latin America have been hiking rates much more aggressively and much earlier than in the rest of the world, even though in Latin America we see quite a lot of inflation right now, it may be the region that ends up controlling inflation much earlier than the rest of the world. OK, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Carlos de Souza, for joining us from Zurich. Thank you. And inflation has soared to triple digits in Lebanon. The currency lost almost 90 percent of its value. That's more than three quarters of Lebanon's population are now poor. And the Lebanese government is running out of cash to buy wheat, medicine and fuel. Lebanon's economic meltdown is one of the world's worst in 150 years. The government says it's in desperate need for financial help to get out of the crisis. It's finally reached a preliminary funding deal with the International Monetary Fund. But the full approval of the $3 billion U.S. dollar loan over 46 months comes with a caveat. 
the Lebanese government has to implement a series of financial reforms. They include an audit of the central bank, restructuring the country's collapsed banking sectors, improving transparency mechanisms, and unifying multiple exchange rates to the spiraling Lebanese pound. Now, if approved, the program would help unlock further foreign aid. Well, Lebanese banks are estimated to have lost almost 69 billion U.S. dollars and have imposed informal capital controls. Savers deprived of access to their deposits are being offered checks worth a fraction of their savings. Many customers have accused the banks of shifting their losses to depositors, and they've taken legal action to recover their money. Zeyna Khudr reports from Beirut. More than $100 billion remains stuck in Lebanon's banks since 2019, when the financial system collapsed. Depositors have been facing limits on withdrawals at unfavorable exchange rates. Now, some banks are closing accounts of mainly British passport holders after a UK court ordered a Lebanese bank to give a depositor his money. Depositors say they are offered a check for the balance, but they are worth less than 20 percent of their value. Manager of the bank told me that I can take my check uh, at the notaries <clears throat> and wander around and see who can accept a banker's check. Banks say they are short of cash and fear if depositors continue winning legal challenges, they will have to declare bankruptcy. They say the answer is for the political authorities to pass a law that would regulate the outflow of foreign currency. Banks have been accused of helping the politically connected transfer their money abroad. Many of them are shareholders in Lebanon's largest banks. Critics called the financial system a Ponzi scheme. For decades, banks lent to the state at high interest rates, while successive governments largely plundered funds and piled up debt until capital inflows slowed and the economy collapsed. And experts believe much of the money is now gone, with people locked out of their savings as they struggle with high inflation and poverty. So there are many challenges in order to get the money back. Uh, we cannot just get it back by doing individual uh, lawsuits. And also we have to see a restructuring of the banking sector and the public debt. And this is what's not happening. Those in power have so far failed to reform a system that they long benefited from. It's been to shift the losses to the people who withdraw their money at around 30% of its value. Already, depositors have lost billions of dollars. Joining me now from Beirut is Nassib Rubriel. Nassib is the chief economist and head of the Economic Research and Analysis Department at Biblos Bank Group. Thank you so much for joining us on the program, sir. So for this deal to become final, Lebanon has to implement a series of reforms. Do you think these reforms are achievable considering the state of the Lebanese economy? And what are the challenges going forward? Uh, the IMF was very explicit in its statement about the eight prior actions that Lebanese authorities need to take for the agreement to be approved and become final by the IMF executive board. Uh, seven of the eight uh, prior actions have to do with the banking system, the Central Bank of Lebanon and commercial banks, uh, such as um, uh, approving a strategy for the restructuring of the banking sector, modifying the banking secrecy law, uh, unifying the exchange rates, the multiple exchange rates, uh, uh, parliament passing capital control measures and uh, passing a, a banking resolution legislation. Uh, so these are all uh, challenging, uh, challenging points and measures. But uh, really, we do not have a choice. If you want to get out of the crisis, I do not believe there is any other alternative than uh, continuing with the IMF and, uh, um, and implementing the reforms according to this agreement with the IMF. So now the responsibility is on Lebanese authorities to prove that they are serious in pursuing this agreement till the end by implementing these eight prior actions. And the, uh, the IMF did not put a timetable for their implementation, knowing that we are close to parliamentary elections on May 15. We're getting close to that. And we have presidential elections in October. So do you so think the, the politicians parliamentary will, elections... Right. Do you think the politicians will at least feel the pressure somewhat? Because as you're saying, time is not on the side of the Lebanese. And, and we do have these parliamentary elections in May. Well, definitely time is not on the side of the Lebanese people or the Lebanese economy or the private sector. Politicians 
have to feel the pressure uh, given the dire uh, living conditions in the country, uh, the, the contraction of the economy, uh, and the very vocal population. So uh, maybe uh, right now it's not an ideal time to start uh, these reforms uh, altogether, but we can start with things that are already on track, like uh, the parliament uh, enacting the budget for 2022 that is already in, in, in parliament, that already has been completed, and uh, for the government to start working on draft legislation and then forward it to parliament after the elections. You, so, you were yes, right. It is, it is, yeah. We are under time, uh, un, under pressure in terms of time and in terms of delivering. Uh, but uh, yeah, there is there is an opportunity there to start the reform process. How will the banks respond to this? Because as you were pointing out just a few moments ago, some of the rules that the IMF have uh, have put forward or stated that need to go ahead, including a central bank audit, reforming the secrecy law, as you were pointing out, evaluation of the country's major banks. These could be sticking points, and particularly for the banks themselves. Will they? Will the banks actually comply? Well, the banks, first of all, have been calling have been calling for a deal with the IMF and for reform since the beginning of the crisis in October of 2019. And the Association of Banks in Lebanon issued a, a statement welcoming the agreement with authorities and urging the authorities to implement these measures. And the banking sector will will cooperate and comply with the uh, requirements of the prior actions, including, as you mentioned, the external audit of the largest 14 banks in the country. It is in the best interest of the banking sector to facilitate as much as it can the, uh, the, the reform measures. And the banking sector has been calling since the start of the crisis, for example, for official capital control measures that until now have not been implemented. So definitely it's in the interest of the banking sector to proceed with all these reforms. And but on the but issue... for them not to be limited to the banking sector, right. there is other things that need to be, uh, to, to be implemented afterwards, like restructuring the public sector, fighting tax evasion, uh, stopping smuggling. That's what smuggling. I wanted to ask you about uh, is my final question, in fact, because, you know, there is deep-rooted corruption and financial mismanagement in Lebanon, as we all know. Uh, this is going to be a major challenge to tackle going ahead, is it not? How do you see that playing out? Well, definitely, there is also a lot of skepticism in Lebanon uh, by the private sector, uh, by a civil society organization, by the ordinary Lebanese, uh, that uh, because we have been through uh, international uh, support and international conferences where Lebanese authorities have pledged uh, reforms in exchange for financial support and nothing materialized. So now the, the, the responsibility is on the political class, on the government, on the legislative branch to demonstrate that they are serious in lifting the Lebanese economy out of its current crisis through this opportunity that is the deal with the IMF. OK, and uh, finally, let me ask you, I mean, it's, it's really the Lebanese people that have been feeling the brunt of this economic crisis for several years now. Is this rescue plan going to bring more relief or more pain to them? Um, that's a very good question. And the Lebanese people think that, you know, uh, th their perception is that uh, deals with IMF uh, means a lot of pain. But we have been suffering for two and a half years already from uh, multiple exchange rates, from high inflation rates, from uh, shortages of liquidity in the market. Uh, I'm sure some of the reforms that the IMF uh, has agreed with the uh, Lebanese authorities on implementing, if they are fully implemented, uh, will be felt by the Lebanese, but for the medium and long term, uh, th there are positive outcomes uh, for, for the Lebanese people. And it's up to Lebanese authorities, the government, to communicate with the Lebanese people on the, on the importance of, of implementing these reforms and their outcome in the medium and long terms. Okay, thank you so much, Nassib Rebrel, for speaking to us from Beirut. Thank you. More than 346 million people are going hungry across Africa. But the situation is particularly bleak in the continent's west and the Sahel region. That's where millions of people face the worst food crisis in a decade. The UN has described the emergency as horrendous and has warned resources to support the most vulnerable are at rock bottom. The World Food Programme says the number of hungry people across West Africa and the Sahel has quadrupled to 41 million between 2019 and 2022. And NGOs are calling on the international community to provide at least $4 billion sought by the UN for the region. International donors, including the EU, 
have pledged almost $2 billion to help ease hunger in the Sahel and Lake Chad region. Well, part of the problem is linked to high food prices, which have increased by up to 30% over the past five years in West Africa. They're expected to go much higher. Nutrition reserves are already decreasing in the Sahel and the war in Ukraine could cause a significant reduction in wheat stocks. Six West African countries import at least 30% of the grain from Russia and Ukraine. From Senegal's capital, Dakar, I'm joined now by Mamadou Diop. He's the regional representative of Action Against Hunger Organization for West and Central Africa. Welcome to uh, the program, Mamadou Diop. So we're reporting about the food insecurity right across the continent. But why is the situation particularly bad in West Africa and the Sahel region? We should say that we have several drivers that worsen the situation in the region uh, and particularly in Sahel. We have climate shocks, which is creating a scarcity of resources, causing population displacement and adding pressure on already limited resources. This, combined with the lack of rainfall, which results in the desertification of several regions in Sahel, generally leads to conflicts. And to ethnic at first, most of the time, before being absorbed by religious, separatist or political ideologies. Uh, in addition, we must say that in addition, uh, the region faces multiple epidemics each year. So COVID-19 was just one more in the already heavy burden in the Sahel. And this fragility, this pressure on the population often leads to loss of income and difficulties in accessing basic social services when they are already limited, which place more or which place many people, I can say millions of people in food and nutritional insecurity every year. Okay, let's break down some of the reasons that you gave and, and first look at the issue of food prices. So uh, they are part of the problem. How much worse could the situation get because of the war in Ukraine? As we know, some West African countries import at least up to 50% of their wheat from both Ukraine and Russia. Yes, yes, but we should say that the situation is uh, already or was already critical because food prices are already very high. And for some countries that import their weight from Russia or Ukraine, yes, we are already starting to see an increase in the price of bread and some wheat products. Uh, the Ukrainian crisis has come to shock populations already in agony. We should say that. However, it should be not that the trend of price increase was observed, we can say, before the beginning of the Ukrainian crisis. This inflationary um, trend at the global level has caused the increase in food prices in the Sahel, both imported and locally produced. Since uh, these countries trade relatively little with Ukraine and Russia, except uh, some countries like Mauritania, Senegal, uh, Benin, for instance, but uh, uh, we should say that the, the, the constant increase of the food prices is maybe also, or we can say is an addition of multiple factors. And right. the ECOWAS sanctions in Mali and speculation on cereal currently have a major role to play in price increase. Let me ask you about the response to the, to the Sahel crisis, because it is uh, one of the worst humanitarian crises yet it's the least funded, or, or one of the least funded, that is. Why do you think that is? We can say we all have this, 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 uh, this, uh, this concern regarding the multiple crises we have in the world. But uh, our mandate is we must act to save lives first. However, we are dealing with prioritization of the aid for coming from donors, we can say that, which means that the response plans are not funded and those that were starting to be funded are suffering from a lack of funding. The, incos, the, the increase, we can say the increase of prices in logistic or foodstuff or drug means that we must readapt our response, which unfortunately will cost more for and when you the, talk about uh, readapting the response, situation. are you talking about more long-term solutions rather than emergency ones? What do you mean by readapting the response? No, we, we should we should do both. This, the, the crisis in Sahel needs needs both. We must respond to the most urgent needs by saving the lives first, and also 
uh, we should work with the population, uh, help their people uh, to um, strengthening basic services, support communities to help them cope with multiple shocks and find alternatives to meet their immediate needs. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Mamadou Diop, for joining us from Dakar. Thank you. Welcome. That's our show for this week. You can get in touch with us by tweeting me at Darin AG and do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. You can also drop us an email, counting the cost, at aljazeera.net is our address. But there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. So that's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Darin Abugeda from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.